All right, that's 4.30. I'm going to hit start webinar. Good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Kreiner, and I'm the faculty director of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this afternoon's webinar on emerging threats to US national security from Ukraine to the South China Sea and beyond. Before we get started, I'd like to just take a moment to give you a bit of brief background for this evening. So last September, the Institute co-sponsored a workshop to mark a watershed moment in the history of American foreign policy the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11th, and the end of America's longest war, the conflict in Afghanistan. This workshop brought together two outstanding panels of scholars and practitioners, one of whom is joining us now, to reflect on the lessons learned over the past 20 years and what they portended for the future of U.S. grand strategy and the interplay between domestic politics and foreign policy. Today, we're very pleased to share with you the excellent series of papers from this workshop which are now published in the latest issue of the Institute's Bipartisan Policy Review. A link to the review will be provided for anyone who's interested in the chat, and you can also access it anytime through our website at iopga.cornell.edu. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our fantastic panel for this evening. First, Annie Forsheimer is a senior non-resident associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a public commentator on foreign policy. Her diplomatic career included positions such as Deputy Chief of Mission in Kabul, Afghanistan, Director of the U.S. Security Assistance Program in Mexico, Lead Human Rights Officer in Turkey and South Africa, and Director for Central American Migration Issues at the National Security Council. Borsheimer is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Our second panelist, James Rogers, is DIAS Assistant Professor in War Studies within the Center for War Studies at Southern Denmark University, an associate fellow within LSE Ideas at the London School of Economics. He's currently a special advisor to the UK Parliament's all-party parliamentary group on drones and a UK Ministry of Defense opinion leader. His research focuses on drone warfare, contemporary security policy, and the history of warfare. And his work has been featured in the Washington Post, The Economist, CNN, The Guardian, and among many other outlets. And finally, Daniel Stoyan is a visiting scholar at the Repi Institute Peace and Conflict Studies here at Cornell, a fellow with a negotiation task force at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard, and most recently served as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Legislative Affairs Bureau at the U.S. Department of State. Previously, he served as the Deputy Executive Director in the South Central Asia Bureau. And co-moderating the discussion of me tonight is Sarah Krebs, the John L. Weatherill Professor of Government and Director of the Tech Policy Lab at Cornell. Uh, Sarah is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and she has had fellowships at the Council on Foreign Relations, where she's a lifetime member, at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and the University of Virginia's Miller Center for Public Affairs. Between 1999 and 2003, she served on active duty in the United States Air Force. I'd now like to invite each of our panelists to offer any brief opening remarks they'd like. Then Sarah and I will follow up with a few questions for our panel, and we will conclude with questions from the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question at any time, please just use the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, uh, put your question into the queue, and we'll do as many to, uh, as best we can to accommodate as many questions as we're able. And so with that, without further ado, Annie, the floor is yours. Uh, then we'll move to James, and then on to Danny. Thank you so much for the kind introduction for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we can really cover anything, I think, of of great uh, interest in a way because the world is facing such a myriad of crises and opportunities. So why don't I just say that one of the things I know as a practitioner is that the architecture of the US government is designed in a way not as much to deal with the structural and highly important issues such as climate change or pandemics, but it gets easily overwhelmed 
by the disruptive and urgent issues of the day. And so I think it's really important in our conversation to talk about both structural issues that may or may not be getting the attention they need, and also opportunities. If the focus is on crises, you make a certain type of policy. But if you're thinking about opportunities, you're making a different kind of policy. And there are many parts of the world where it is far more appropriate to think in terms of opportunities. In Latin America and Africa, for example, what was predicted as sort of overall disaster from COVID has definitely taken a huge economic toll. But we've actually seen many, many countries emerge with institutions of governance as strong or in a few cases stronger than when they started. And Africa certainly performed in its public health sector admirably well, especially when compared to us and, and many other countries with a lot more wealth at their disposal. So overall, I would like to see a conversation of, about opportunities as well as crises and about America's role. And the last thing I'll say is we need to be careful about being pushed by sentiment and coverage of the war into making foreign policy decisions that have extremely long lasting and wide implications. Thank you. Thank you to, uh, to Douglas and, and Sarah for inviting us here today. To take a, a different track to Annie, I'll move more towards the um, operational threats, I suppose you could you could you could call them. And although it's it's still very early to learn lessons from war in Ukraine, one thing that has surprised me and, and stuck out for me is the extent to which drones have been such a transformative and, and successful military technology for the Ukrainian military to take on a far more powerful nation state and to achieve some um, quite extraordinary uh, wins, if you wish to put it like that. And when it comes back round to learn lessons, perhaps for threats to the US military and allies in the future, it really shows us that uh, if the old adage was true during the Second World War, that the bomber always gets through, then we can start to think about how the drone used in multiples and rudimentary swarms and multi-drone deployments can always get through in an age where we have rudimentary air defense systems and we've neglected air defense for a generation. And look at this now in Ukraine and see how well our allies have done there. But the Russians have also succeeded pretty well with their own drone technologies. And actually, this is a lesson we should have been learning as both the United States and the West for quite a long time since around 2016, when we've seen the emergence um, and proliferation of drones to over 102 different state actors and 63 plus non-state actors. And here I turn our attention perhaps for a better lesson from the Middle East. And as we see Iranian designed and supplied drones being passed on to Houthi rebels who in turn then take those drones and transform them locally and produce them indigenously and pass them on in an unchecked fashion to a range of other militias in the region and across into Iraq. We're seeing on an almost weekly basis now that precision strike and drone strikes are coming into US diplomatic and military sites in the region. And it's gonna make us rethink established practices of tactics, but also a light footprint strategy where we've relied on being more in our bastions um, and relying on drone air forces. And I just wonder the extent to which we can continue to rely on this, I suppose you call it remote warfare, light footprint warfare into the future when precision strike in the hands of the enemy means guaranteed destruction for those existing sites we have in the furthest regions of the world. Thanks so much, James. And thank you to Annie. And apologies to everyone else my, uh, for my sound before I was trying to switch my headphones. So with that, uh, Danny, uh, if you'd like to make some opening remarks, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. And um, listen, I, I appreciate just being uh, able to participate in this, um, this conversation, right? Like. Uh, one, just to be alongside such brilliant and accomplished panelists of Annie and James. And then two, I um, appreciate your guys' patience as I'm speaking with this um, ridiculous background music. Hopefully you're not hearing too, too much of it, but I'm, I'm not exactly in the ideal Zoom location, but I really wanted to participate in this important discussion. Um, as was said in the introduction, right, I'm a, I'm a career diplomat and I've spent most of my career working on conflicts, right? Whether it's extremism in Saudi Arabia was my first assignment, uh, post-genocide reconciliation in Rwanda, um, 
And probably the most difficult has been just the, the partisanship in DC when I worked on legislative affairs. But um, the past year, I've really focused on kind of the study and practice of negotiation. So kind of taking a step back a little bit like what Annie was suggesting of taking a step back from the day to day and really trying to understand negotiations and um, ironically teaching one course, it's called a post, um, Negotiating Post-Soviet Conflict, which was not designed um, you know, with this thought in mind of the world that we would be living in. Um, but you know, I want to I want to kind of propose four four I don't know if you want to call them like horsemen of the apocalypse or four like factors that seem to have frustrated in, in my work and in, in the in the conflicts that I'm seeing right now four four things that prevent us from resolving conflicts or from um, you know standing in the way of successful negotiations and um, you know the four of them would be and I guess maybe through the through the help of this panel and this um, this session maybe you guys can help me refine these but my idea is like you know. The four of these, again, calling me like the horsemen of the apocalypse or something like that would be like, the first one is distrust, right? And you see just a ton of that in the conflicts anywhere from Ukraine to South China Sea, like the, just the distrust of the different sides. Um, the second one would be disdain, right? Just having like total contempt for the other side and almost demonizing them, right? And that makes it really difficult to, to engage in successful negotiations. Um, the third one would be like a disregard or stonewalling, right? Of just not not addressing the real conflicts, like the underlining conflicts or the underlining um, issues that, that, uh, that underpin these conflicts. And then the force would be just defensiveness, right? So focusing on the past, um, preventing progress from happening. And you know, um, Wendy Sherman, our current deputy secretary has a, a great memoirs where she talks about her, her time negotiating the JCPOA with Iran and, and just remarkable how much time she said that um, was spent talking about the past rather than What's the future of the Iranian uh, US relationship that they wanted? Anyway, so I'd, I'd kind of frame those and maybe through, uh, throughout the discussion, welcome any um, comments or thoughts on those. But let me, let me stop there and, and get back to the panel. Thank thanks you, so Danny. Much, Danny. Oh, yeah. And, uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> and thanks, Annie and James. Uh, I thought I would just jump in with a, a first question that I think ties together some of what I've been hearing. I appreciate Annie's point about not being led by emotion in uh, approaches to US foreign policy. Uh, I also hear Danny talking about these obstacles to uh, US, uh, the US Americans ability to kind of negotiate abroad. I mean, I guess I have this question though, is there anything really that uh, the US can be doing at this point and beyond, I mean, right now the U.S. has, uh, with its allies, escalated uh, sanctions and sent material aid to Ukraine. Uh, but that there seems to be a, uh, an approach that I would say is not, you know, has been actually quite sober on the part of the U.S. rather than led by emotion. What else could the U.S. really be doing beyond what it's doing now? Well. I'll just offer that I, I agree. I think the US approach and European approach have been sober. I think it's the drumbeat of, you know, the, the issue of actual war crimes and a little bit of a drumbeat of why aren't we doing more. This is very natural, but I'll say personally from the experience of seeing out the end of our conflict in Afghanistan, everything about getting involved in Afghanistan seemed natural at the time too. And Americans have a terrible issue with strategic patience. So if we got even more deeply involved in Ukraine, are we truly going to see out the full consequences of what that would mean? And I think, for example, if we wanted to know if the American people wanted to get more involved, you know, beyond <clears throat> the sympathy and the social media and the wearing the colors, would they pay more taxes for it? Wars cost money. If in, in past years and decades, Americans have paid in order to help in the conduct of a war, but if politicians aren't actually prepared to ask Americans to pay money, uh, then I'm not really sure that they know that the American people will be with them all the way through what would be needed. So what more could the US be doing? I'll just say that I think that we stay agile and we stay networked uh, with good alliances that can even be great again, to coin a phrase, and to say that, we, that we're able to meet the adversary in all of the different fields of the adversary's choosing. 
James, I'd love to hear the European perspective, the UK slash European pr perspective on this. I, I talked about the US as kind of what, what, what the possible roles might be in mediating this crisis. What about in the limitations? Uh, what about the other side of the Atlantic on this question? Well, I think it's great to see uh, US support for NATO once again, uh, and being in Europe, uh, based in Denmark, and also a citizen of the UK. Once you had a president um, referring to NATO as obsolete, and then we had our own discussions in Europe about NATO potentially being brain dead, and that was the French President Macron who was stating these things, it's good to see that um, NATO have come together in an almost galvanized fashion. But this raises a couple of points as well. Of course, you want to see sustained US backing of NATO, and that will likely and probably should be a uh, point of discussion in the uh, in the election 2024. Um, and I think one thing that needs to be thought about at a broader, more strategic level now is how this increased investment in NATO. You have Germany pumping an awful lot of money. You have Denmark that is also doing the same. We've got confirmed commitments to the 2% going over the next decade. It's where this money is invested properly to make sure that the US and NATO can work together to meet those threats, as Annie was saying, as they arise around the world and get in front of them. Now, Ukraine, to, to many, including the French, was most certainly a surprise when the Russians did decide to move in and to start that open conflict. But where are we going to look to next? And which flank of NATO are we going to invest in to make sure that you can deter Russian aggression? Is this going to be in NATO's southern flank? Do we need to look back down to the Sahel, for example, and increasing tensions there and increasing Russian involvement? Do we need to look up to NATO's northern flank into the Arctic, where you have a number of Arctic states that are NATO members, uh, including the United States, and you have a flexing of Russian military might up there as well? Are these the future areas that we really need to start focusing on, getting our expertise up and making sure that we're investing in the appropriate technologies and of course, military hardware to make sure they are protected and defended now and into the near future. Well, if I might ask the next question then, um, thinking back to the very early days of the Russian invasion, uh, the US and European allies put a lot of effort and time into trying to persuade China to help mediate a peaceful solution in Ukraine. And these efforts have quite clearly failed. So what are the consequences for US diplomacy in the Pacific moving forward? I don't know if uh, Danny wants to, uh, to handle that. Sure, I'm happy to jump in on that. I mean, I think, um, I especially like that question because I think it's, it's easy um, for us. And I think, I think Andy made this point of like to, to focus on, you know, the, the, the current problem at hand, right? You know, I think, um, before the Ukraine invasion, there was uh, there was Afghanistan and the withdrawal from Afghanistan. There was the refugees and all the, um, the human suffering. And you know, a little bit before that, it was Syria and the Syrian refugees. And it's easy for us to focus all the news cycle on that and all the policy attention on that, and then we lose sight. And I and I I'm happy to hear that we're we're not losing sight of China and what's happening in the South uh, South China Sea. Um, you know, and that combines kind of to the to the previous question of what could the U.S. be doing. Um, and what does this mean for us? I mean, I think one of the, the important things is strengthening the cooperation with China. Uh, and, and even though that, that first attempt didn't work out so well of, of having China mediate, but still trying to think of like, at least specifically for the US and our national interests, you know, what are all the ways we can cooperate with China? We cooperate with China on just a multitude, multitude of issues. Um, and especially in this current time when Putin is reaching out and trying to um, create more of a fissure between the United States and China, of figuring out how do we, how do we ensure that we don't encourage an anti-West coalition between Russia and China? And so figuring out all the ways that we, um, we strengthen the relationship, we identify areas to cooperate on, and then also like focusing on strengthening the international institutions, right? Like, like NATO, the UN, what are the international institutions that China does seem to support, does seem to abide by, does want to play by the rules, wants to influence those, um, but, but addressing those international institutions and international order in a very different way than Russia is and making sure that, that China stays on, on that track um, with us, I think is very important. 
I can I can add in there and jump in there from again a bit more of a, a European perspective with the Pacific being quite far away. I think just to echo the uh, the sentiments of NATO Secretary General is that China is also coming to Europe. And that's something that needs to be countered in, in many different ways. One of the, the great concerns, and again, you'll, you'll, you'll hear me um, harping on about drones quite a lot, but for me, they're quite a flash topic um, in the fact that where you see uh, supply of drones or contention around them, they signify something broader in terms of geopolitics and national security concerns. And when it comes to China's um, Belt and Road Initiative, and you start to see the supply of military drone technologies from China into places like Serbia, you, you start to worry ever so slightly, especially as Serbia is on the waiting list to join the European Union. And so you start to see these weak points of infiltration within the European Union. And this was a major concern around Huawei as well. So it's, it's less about um, the NATO concerns of the Pacific and more about China coming to Europe. Although saying that, there's something that I would be relatively concerned about, and that's this recent occupation of the Kuril Islands. And as we move up towards the Bering Sea and around towards the Northern Sea Route, which is part of China's Polar Silk Road, and you see the vast amounts of um, Russian investment in their military technologies to safeguard that region to make sure it is a viable, vital bloodline for Russian economic interests and the transport of Chinese goods from the Pacific round towards Europe and into the Atlantic, then you start to see how those areas there, and if you look where those islands are in a map, it's about guarding the entry to that important new Suez, as they call it. So the strategic choke points around the world are changing at the same time. So if you don't mind, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, of talk in the Q&A uh, about Taiwan. And so since we're on the topic of China, uh, what do you think the implications of, of the developments of the last six, eight weeks have been uh, for the likelihood of a, of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan um, because of the, the Russian invasion, because of the response of America and Europe to it? You know, how has this changed the ball game, if at all? I think as, a, as, as just an observer in this case, I would say the two things I've seen that are a little contradictory is that number one, um, China is making sure not to criticize Russia in specific terms that would apply to anything it might do in the future in, in Taiwan. Nothing about you know, bombing cities because you would have to bomb a city. Um, but at the same time, the other set of observations are that China doesn't really want this level of publicity, nor does it want anything like the level of sanctions or attempted cutting out of China from the international economic order that it's seen with Russia. So that's that part, at least, is a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, how badly do they want it? I think they may have invented strategic patience. So in fact, they probably will think of a way uh, over time because of what we've seen them do with Hong Kong, for example. Uh, so there have been some a lot of questions, not just about Taiwan, but some of the economic impacts of the, the war. And I wanted to turn to some of those questions, um, including the international business implications of uh, the kind of tensions between China and Taiwan, but also uh, a question from Josh Pruderman, who is uh, referencing that the outsourced software development for US startups in Ukraine. I might also add to that the question of uh, commodities and fertilizer and food and uh, against the backdrop of inflation. And so who wants to take that set of really big questions or any pieces of that, whether the economic implications or sort of specifically on startups or commodities or food, fertilizers, inflation? This is Danny. I'll, I'll jump in real quickly just on, you know, I was, I was just on the phone a couple of days ago with our embassy in Lebanon, who was reporting that just in terms of like wheat and grain and these commodities, right, that they got 70% um, of their grain and wheat is from, um, is from Ukraine, right? So the, the impacts are, you know, all the way in regions that you wouldn't normally think would have any interest or influence on what's going on. And I think, you know, it goes without saying that, that war is always costly. But you know, trying to figure out what to do 
now that there is a war is a separate issue and that's um like, <laughs> so so difficult but i think you know as, as a diplomat right what i like to try to focus on is also like okay well how do we prevent the next war so yes there's lots to be thinking about i don't want to dismiss the importance of trying to um minimize the pain and, and that's going on in you right now but also think about to, to the previous question of like how do we how do we prevent this from happening in Taiwan, right? Like, what, are the, what do we need to do in the international sphere? What do we need to do with, we need to do with our allies to make sure that this doesn't spread? Um, and, and part of that is, right, making sure that we, we are listening to what, our, what others are saying, right? You know, in the same way that Russia and Putin have been unequivocal in their descriptions of how they view Ukraine and Georgia even, China has made those same comments about, about Taiwan. So what are we doing in the international sphere to prepare for that likelihood, you know? whether that likely, you know, to put it on a percentage is, is difficult and just a guessing game, but um, what possibly can we do, right? How do we, how do we diversify um, in the energy sector, right? How do, we, how do we diversify in the energy sector? Um, you know, the US government has made big, big attempts, big pushes, and the last administration continue with this administration on Nord Stream 2 and making sure that Europe diversifies away. Um, you know, what do we do? Um, it, USAID try, tries to have lots of different entrepreneurial programs and trying to sustain um, different sources of income for entrepreneurs in, in Ukraine and elsewhere. So I think a lot of a lot of those answers has to be coming from um, from from that field. But let me let me stop there and see if anyone else has thoughts on that. I can I can I can take it into a, a European perspective and a, a kind of everyday lived perspective. You you start to see how um, the cutoff of supplies of, of Russian oil and gas, or at least the reduction, not the complete cutoff, has led to in part spikes in the cost of fuel in the United Kingdom and in places across Europe. But you've got a fifty percent increase in heating your home in the UK at a time of great economic hardship that is coupled by Brexit, which in itself was partly, we believe, to be um, swayed by Russian propaganda, and you have people struggling to heat their homes and to feed their children. This is, this is fuel poverty at its very worst. And as you start to see two countries, Russia and Ukraine, that supply something like 12% of the world's calories, and you, you start to think back to the First World War. You know, we fought entire campaigns over opening the Dardanelles Straits. The Gallipoli campaign was about ensuring that Russian grain can enter the global markets to stabilize an increasingly turbulent system. And I don't think we've even seen the beginning of the global impact of this food shortage and fuel cutoff in terms of the economics of the world and in terms of hunger. I'll just note in my whole career, which sort of coincided with this very specific post-Cold War period, Globalization was a goal itself. It wasn't even just a, a means to something else. It was the goal. And, uh, and I think what we're seeing is how vulnerable we all are feeling right now. So is, are we going to perhaps overreact though? Are we going to try to deglobalize and, and you know, put up walls and move our in, in near shore and all the rest of it? Uh, but it's very tempting right now to see globalization as a massive liability. Yeah, you know, and, and that actually uh, sort of is resonant of the uh, Bi President Biden's State of the Union, which was uh, something that I think was sometime in coming, accelerated by the pandemic. But this question of uh, supply chain resilience and his message in the State of the Union was made in America. And it and I, and I've been, I feel like I've been seeing this a lot more in the New York Times is globalization is dead. And we're all kind of coming back to our um, respective, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it, it strikes me as a, a little bit, like you said, Annie, maybe overkill, because, you know, if we go back to the 80s, is this going to be Latin America import substitution? Because that didn't really work very well. I'm curious to, yeah, and I appreciate uh, this, this historical perspective, James. Um, and, I, you know, in the 12% of calories from Russia, Ukraine, we're so integrated now. And now the message seems to be, look, because of the pandemic, we had these supply talks and because of the integration with, uh, on food and fuel, the answer seems to be, well, let's pull back and make everything here. It, you know, is there a risk of kind of over-interpreting what we're seeing? I mean, I think... It's hard to overinterpret it in a way, but we still have to 
stay part of the course. You know, it's, it is dire in some respects, but it still can't be solved by completely dismantling the system, I believe. And going back to our discussion about China, it might be the one area of the most fertile common ground that we have, which is their investment in the global system as well. And their interest in, uh, you know, they, they want it to work because they'd like to dominate it, but they want it to work. And so is, is that something I'm sure already being tried to look at ways that we're, um, we're pushing them to push Russia towards any kind of a solution because Russia seems to not care if the global system disappears, but China doesn't feel the same way. I think we lost Danny. I think we and have. it's not just a matter if, um, if, if China wants this to work, China needs this to work. Just like every other country on earth, China has been massively hit by COVID and its production and its growth. And you're starting to see the internal dynamics of China start to ever so slightly come undone with the mass protests you have to the gigantic lockdowns, almost unprecedented that we've seen during these last easy two years. And so China needs to get its industry moving again. It needs to get selling globally in order for the regime to survive. I think Danny's back. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think that's that's an important uh, perspective. I'm, I'm curious, though, you know, if we think about China's investment in this kind of economic order, where, where is Russia in that? And you know, I, I've, again, I've been seeing a lot of conversation about this being a watershed moment, and it's going to be hard to go back to the status quo ante uh, with respect to Russia, just because of the erosion of trust that came from this this huge intervention. Where do you see Russia in this context of, of economic or security order? Yes, Sarah, that's a really, I, I think about that a lot. You know, I was surprised. I've got um, some friends that have just phoned me yesterday talking about, um, you know, putting on a boycott of Russian restaurants in New York. And I thought, really, has it gotten, has it gotten to that level really where just the name Russia or the, the Russian flag, um, you know, brings such emotion to people? And I think, you know, what Annie had warned in the very beginning, right? It's like, how do we, how do we ensure that emotion stays out of this and that, you know, that we make important policy decisions, um, that, that are not based on emotion. Um, and, and I think that question of like, is Russia doomed? Um, I one thing I would say in the, in the international sphere is like nothing is inevitable and history isn't static, right? You look at the cooperation between Israel and Germany right now, or the United States and Japan, or the US and um, Vietnam, right? And in the short term, boy, that Russian, that Russian brand is, is not looking good right now, right? And it on all fronts um, from like athletes to businessmen, um, it's all bad, but I think partly what we all should be doing, right? This is this is you know, the 11th biggest economy, right? This is a huge, huge, right? In the China views, right? Three world powers in the in the world: China, the United States, and Russia, right? So it's it's not as simple as saying, well, we're going to put them in the corner. They got to go and have time out for a while, and when they you know sort themselves out, they can come back into the world stage. Um, and so now it's really important to figure out, well, how do we bring Russia back? How do we ensure that um, there is cooperation? Uh, and it, to tell you the truth, it scares me. In um, at the Davis Center, there was a long discussion at, at Harvard about, um, you know, not working with Russian universities. And you think when that starts happening on all levels, like how do you how do you come back from that? But again, like history shows us that it is possible, um, and it's important that we 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 make that happen. Thanks so much. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, there have been a couple of questions in the, uh, the Q&A uh, asking about the return of the, the deployment of weapons of mass destruction. So the administration has raised the specter that uh, the Russian military might consider chemical or biological weapons or even strategic nuclear weapons uh, should the situation deteriorate further and the Kremlin be unable to achieve its goals through conventional means. Uh, how much of a threat uh, do we think that really is? Uh, and is there anything that NATO can do uh, that it isn't already doing or that we might not be paying attention to, uh, to try and deter that? Um, I will, I'll be very interested actually to hear, James has some thoughts on this one. Um, 
you know, I, I think it is sadly, you know, such an important uh, threat to keep in consideration. And it feels awful to say something like this, but you do have to provide an off ramp for somebody with this kind of power who, um, you know, otherwise may feel that they don't have other choices. There's nothing rational about that decision making. But as the people who will also suffer from the consequences, we, we do have to think of what is, an, what is an outcome. And of course, the Ukraine people should be the main architects of whatever that is. But peace agreements tend to feel very unsatisfying to large numbers of people. Uh, and yet, uh, it's as a former diplomat, it's exactly what you're supposed to be aiming towards uh, over time is a peace agreement that both sides can live with. Um, and even if we all hate it at the time, I, I think we can hate the war uh, more than that. I do wanna hear James. I also wanna know uh, either now or later in the conversation, because I've thought about this a lot. I've, I come more from the defense perspective and I think ultimately it seems like there has to be an off ramp for Putin to save face. And I can't come up with what that would look like, but I, I feel like we have some, some diplomats in the room. What would that look like? Well, uh, Danny, I, I will leave that one to you if you want. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, um, you know, I won't pretend to be able to get into Putin's head by any means, but I, I do think that Part of what we need is to have more of those conversations. I think a lot of the conversations we end up having, um, you know, we call them negotiations, we call them discussions, we call them, you know, whatever kind of talks. They're really just like marketplace bargaining, right? We're just, you know, saying we want this, no, you want this. What kind of, uh, you know, compromise can we come to? But I think there needs to be some some serious conversations about well, what is it you really want, right? What what would you, what are the issues here? Um, and I think, you know. We all can name them off the top of our head, at least a handful of them. But I think there needs to be some deep, deep conversations. And um, you know, our our former Deputy Secretary Bill Burns, who's now head of the CIA, um, wrote in his memoirs, which must have been back in the I don't know, Annie. What, when did he serve as our ambassador to Russia? Probably in the early '90s. Is that right? Uh, he served, I believe, there. He served twice, and he okay. was there during one of the Ukraine episodes. Yeah, and so he, he wrote in his memoirs, um, he, he referenced a message he sent back to Secretary Rice at the time, you know, saying that every person he spoke to, right, not just at the, at the Politburo and not just in the military, but, you know, even his barber um, would have a visceral reaction to NATO and expanding NATO uh, and saying that this is, this is just how they feel, right, and really truly understanding what are a handful of issues that Russia really cares about, that Putin really cares about, and um, I, I think to Annie, Annie has such a great point of saying, as dis, you know, as distasteful as it would be to give Putin a win, right, um, of finding out some type of win for him. And again, like, you know, I haven't, I haven't been working the Russia account. I haven't been to Russia. I think what we need is the people that are actually sitting down and having those conversations, right? Not in a negotiation, but a really true trying to understand the Russian perspective and figuring out, you know, again, something that is painfully distasteful for us, um, but that would give Russia a win. Anyway, that's Sarah. I'm sorry. That's a long-winded way of saying I have no clue. But I think we need to, um, to 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 really have those serious, serious listening moments. Let me just throw one other thing into the mix, which is that some successful, you know, diplomatic engineered, diplomatically engineered peace agreements have added in sort of a third factor or triangulated to something else. Right? The famous conclusion to the Cuban Missile Crisis ended up being about our missiles in Turkey. So if we're thinking that way, and I'm sure people are, especially Bill Burns, you know, it may end up being that it's not just about the binary that you see in the Russia and Ukraine, but something else of interest and importance to Russia that we can bring into the mix. So, you know, I have a segue back to nuclear uh, security, which I derailed, and it has to do with also this diplomatic solution. And I think about the Budapest me Memorandum um, from 1994, where Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons after the Cold War in exchange for uh, security assurances. And I just, you know, Danny, you talked about what's palatable to us. Uh, but I do wonder, 
how credible a peace will be to a country that uh, Ukraine that has really, I think, been burned on multiple occasions. Uh, so how do we negotiate something that is not just that we can, we, the West, you know, can live with, but this is Ukraine, this is their country that they are, are fighting over. They need to have some sort of confidence that this agreement will be credible. And I, I would imagine that that will, every day that goes by is a higher bar for them. Uh, so I'll just kind of put that sort of comment out there and maybe come back to nuclear security uh, and the threat, how, how real a threat is this, James? What a poison chalice of a question. <laughs> how, how much of a threat are nuclear weapons? Well, I would say, of course, an in incredibly large threat to global peace and security. But um, I think one of the things to look at here, you know, I, I wake up in the morning in Denmark and I'm told on BBC News of all places that uh, President Putin is considering dropping a nuclear bomb to send a message. You're going to drop it in between Scotland and Denmark in the North Sea. So as I'm eating my cornflakes in the morning, it's not the best thing you want to hear, seeing as I live on a small island right next to that area in a strategically important point between the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. Uh, do I think that that is going to happen? No. I don't. Um, is it something that my friends and family ask me about an awful lot? Yes, it's probably the first question that I'm asked. And it's of great concern to an awful lot of people, um, especially when there's talk about, you know, Scotland being number one on Putin's list to blow up, because that's where we keep our nuclear submarines and, and trident. So this is more about sending fear, I think, to the people of Europe. It's about giving him some sort of leverage and showing that Russia deserves respect in these negotiations. Now, I don't really like discussions of what can we do to make Putin happy. I'm not a diplomat, and so it's not on my first priority to make Mr. Putin happy. It's more what can keep Ukraine a secure sovereign nation and, uh, and Zelensky happy as well, and Ukrainian people. But we are gonna have to provide that off-ramp. Escalating nuclear tensions or the US replying in turn or nuclear powers replying in turn within NATO is not going to provide us with that off-ramp. And instead, I think that that was very much downplayed when we had Putin's um, ramping up of alerts. It was something which was not taken and not run with by the West. And I think very rightly so, as it meant that we didn't escalate at that level. I don't know what peace in Ukraine is going to look like. I wrote a piece for the Washington Post last week looking at historical examples that we could potentially look at, at times when Stalin himself knew when to retreat back from the West in order to give up certain gains um, and to make sure that there was a balance of power and peace and security. Will Putin prove to be more difficult to deal with than Stalin? I'm not so sure, but as Zelensky offers up neutrality as a possible option, one of the things we discussed is not having Western forces based in Ukraine as well, although, of course, having some very hard security guarantees there. But I wonder, again, it comes back to this question that Annie alluded to. What does Putin really want? One of the things that worries me today is how there's been extra pressure applied on Finland and Sweden in terms of what happens to them if they join NATO. Are guarantees that they won't do that going to be tied into any peace deal in Ukraine? There's a, there's a lot still to find out, but um, yeah, I think we do need to somehow find that off ramp for Putin. On that topic, um, and at the risk of uh, of asking Danny to do what he said he will not do, and kind of to get into the head of Vladimir Putin. Uh, there have been a couple of questions in the chat that have specifically asked about Eastern Ukraine, the newest or latest front, main front of the fighting, uh, the possibility that Zelensky has raised that maybe there could be, in addition to neutralization, some form of territory that would be given up. Um, does anyone think that that might be enough of an off-ramp for Putin to claim victory for a domestic audience? Uh, or would those domestic audience costs be too high and he can't stop uh, at simply taking the Donbass and creating a, a land bridge uh, through whatever is left of Mariupol to uh, Crimea. Such a good this this is Danny. I'll jump in here. It's it, it's such a good question. I I I bet you a lot of it has to do with where we are in the moment. So I think if we were to have this conversation, um, you know, before before the invasion, right? The, before the recent invasion. Um, you know, I don't think that would have been palatable at all, right? That would have been, right? The, the aspirations were global. They were, they were beyond even Ukraine, right? And I think now 
um, Putin's in a survival mode. And so it's, it is really thinking of, uh, and he is a master of the, of the spin. So yeah, if he can somehow spin that Eastern Ukraine or some part of Donbass is, um, is success, um, then maybe that'll work. But I think we should all be um, realistic to realize that'll work for a moment until he kind of gets his feet back on, uh, doesn't feel that threat internally as much. And then once he gets that, he'll have larger aspirations again. And, um, and I think part of what makes this such a tricky, tricky um, conflict is that there is no, you know, this idea of searching for some silver bullet. Somehow we can piece together a perfect set of options that would put a nice bow on this and Putin would smile and say, be happy and the international world would be happy. It is probably unrealistic. It's not that we're um, not smart enough to come up with a solution. I just don't think there is a solution that, that solves all of those problems. And so, you know, we're in that situation of how do we, and I think James is making this point, like how do we, how do we reduce the devastation, you know, the humanitarian devastation in Ukraine? Like how do we, how do we ensure that Ukrainians keep their territorial integrity, right? How do we, what's the base you know, in Maslow's hierarchy, what's, what are we at the very, very base to make sure we have that? Once we get that secured, then we move on to something else. But I think, um, you know, at, at this point, um, I think Putin's uh, definition of success is going to be very different than what it was a month ago. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Annie, do you want to come in on this point? Sure. Um, I absolutely agree with, with the uh, Danny and James and and I would say that um, you know it's not uh, it, it's not clear if you cut a deal today whether that would be a satisfying one for the future. Um, you know, there's there's this expression where we're all happy to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. I mean, you know, it's their sacrifice right now, and so if they want to have peace on a terrible set of terms, that is their decision and. Um, you know, if it emboldens Vladimir Putin, then we all have to deal with the consequences. But fundamentally, this will be their choice. Um, I also think, though, that, you know, as, as we've talked about, history is really long and replete with all these examples of successes that, in, in fact, aren't successful at all. And so if Ukraine falls somehow in part to Putin, but eventually joins the European Union. I, I think that the attractive power of the EU is going to be far more powerful over time than the thuggery uh, that Russia represents. And so what's the longer, you know, what's the longer game? And are we are we definitely playing that? And I do think, you know, I'm feeling a little self-critical about the US government right now. We're not all that good at thinking about it, planning for it, putting our mechanisms in place for it, uh, talking about it, convincing our population about it, all of these elements of the long game. In 20 years, are we going to be talking about Ukraine or are we going to be talking about the climate change? disaster that um, we didn't avert in 2022 because we were busy. Yeah, it's a great, a great intervention, Annie. Uh, so kind of coming back to this point about history that you raised and, and uh, James's piece in the Washington Post and uh, one of the questions in the chat, uh, which seems to reflect a uh, devil's advocate to the uh, to what I'm the, the the caution and restraint that I'm hearing from the panel uh, is whether the uh, how is this phrase the off ramp ship has sailed uh, once we uh, branded Putin a war criminal but also kind of this question about appeasement um, and whether this actually if we carve out. And again, we, you know, we need to remember that this is not, it's not we, this isn't our country, this is Ukraine. So ultimately, I think it's really up to them. Uh, but if there, if Ukraine is willing to allow part of uh, the East to be carved out, does that just embolden uh, Putin? Um, and how, how do we want to think about that dynamic, uh, whether, and what we can learn um, from history there, James or um, Annie or Danny? Well, it is, it is we in the fact that we have a, a dog in this fight. 
We're investing millions, if not billions of dollars of military equipment, of economic aid, and it has stark implications for the defense of Europe. If you're sitting in Poland um, and you have Polish leaders in the Baltic states going in and talking with Zelensky and making very brave trips into Kiev, then you can see that this is going to have to be a piece that also resonates with the states that are allied and very much on that border. When you've got Russian missiles being fired close to the Polish border, you know, this is something that is going to have to be negotiated as, uh, as, an, as an alliance, although of course not a NATO alliance. And it's something that the US, I'm pretty certain, will also have a say in as well. We've had Boris Johnson um, down in, in Kiev this week, and I'm sure negotiations have been taking place at that same point in time. So I, I of course, it is all about Ukrainian sovereignty and soaring and making sure that Ukraine is happy with that end agreement. But there will have to be compromise and compromise that the NATO alliance and the allies of the West are also happy with. I'll, um, I utterly agree with what James said, but just for the sake of argument, I'll, I'll put out there that you know tyrants are appeased all the time and it is a terrible thing. Uh, it isn't always done in a, such a, you know, sort of well photographed way, but think about Tibet. It, it is happening all over the world. And um, the US makes decisions every day about where to intervene. And so if it were sort of simple in terms of being the one, and this is the place we stand up and you know, it's it's so clear that this appeasement is different than other appeasements. But I don't know. I mean, I think there's an argument out there that we have a, a highly imperfect system and a world full of bullies, some of whom get their way. And again, are the U.S. people who famously spend almost no time at all thinking about foreign policy ready to do what is necessary? to stand up to this bully and maybe other bullies because it will involve a lot of blood and treasure over time. Annie, it really sounds like realism is alive and well here. <laughs> well, it's a, it's one point of view. It looked like Danny was going to jump in here. No, no, I was I was going to say the same thing about it. it's it's um gosh, that realistic view is is it's tough to swallow, but I I think right so whether it emboldens Putin or not, it's hard to imagine that, uh, you know, again, that how could it not embolden Putin? But I think, you know, um, it also feels awkward to, you know, discuss a piece of someone else's territory, right? Of, mm -hmm. of me saying whether it happens or not. But I think, you know, getting back to what I, what I think Annie was saying, which really resonates with me a lot is, is, okay, well, in addition to that, so whether some part of Ukraine gets carved off, if there's some concession that's made if there's some you know off ramp but what else are we doing like have we put mechanisms in place to prevent violations of international law so what else are we doing to strengthen you know the laws of the united nations or the teeth of the united nations or of nato you know do we have stronger treaties on arms control in the meantime um especially now that we've we've all talked about nukes and i feel like there's more game theory talking about the use of nuclear weapons as opposed to development of more treaties to prevent the use of nuclear weapons or to start disarming some of um, all of our stockpiles of nuclear weapons, right? And, and, you know, is this what's happening right now? Is this strengthening our relationship with China or not? I mean, this should, this should um, we, we as the United States at least need to find ways to use this crisis, this situation to re-engage China, to have a stronger relationship with China and to not push China towards, um, towards, towards Russia. So I think, I think it's also important to figure out well, what else are we doing in the meantime to prevent these from happening and when it does happen that we can respond in a better way. Mm. So I appreciate that point about international treaties, but I do wonder, you know, looking at the, we, I think there may be a reason why the United Nations hasn't been invoked in this conversation is, it seems like international institutions are uh, other than NATO, which is a regional security organization, um, have do not really have a role to play where Russia as a veto member is at the center. Uh, how do we think about, I mean, are we going back to the Cold War in that sense where the UN didn't really have a, a role to play? Um, and what do we think about kind of some of these international institutions and their uh, inertness, potential for inertness now? Um, I'm 
I'm going to just say that, that yes, we may be going back to a period where the Security Council is, as you say, is inert, is unable, and it's been that way really since the Syria debacle mm -hmm. a decade ago. Um, but there are so many other elements of our international architecture, and I'll, I'll just be the cheerleader for the conflicts that we don't even know about that got avoided because uh, or averted because of that architecture or the norm setting that is very, very powerful in, um, in political and human rights and economic spheres and areas of cooperation on science and technology. I, I'm a fan. And so I know that this looks like the sort of death blow to internationalism, but I will say it's happening and internationalism is also happening. And it's still very, very powerful and very important. As somebody who works closely with the nations, uh, especially on issues of, 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 of drones and assassinations, um, I, I most certainly am not going to be the one who's, who sits here and, and, and badmouths the UN, but if anything urges more of an investment within that institution to ensure that we're upholding the ever so important international norms that we've seeked to build and to, to, to entrench since 1945. And I think if anything is more of a reminder than that, it's, it's what's going on in, in Ukraine at this current moment in time. And of course, we need to also look back at ourselves uh, the stalemate of the United Nations Security Council is not just of, of Russia's doing or of, of China's doing, but when we look back to our, our own uses of things like the responsibility to protect, which has in many ways been taken and ran with by Putin as a reason not to cooperate and to have all pulled over their eyes in the UN Security Council. And when we see his international law speak, um, his justifications for going into Ukraine in 2014, and again recently, we see a certain a mocking and a harking back to, to Libya and what they see as um, being misled for the, the reasons why um, the United Nations was able to approve that responsibility to protect third pillar motion and, and go into the country. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of things to resolve and discuss and to overcome in order to make sure that the UN can be once again a, a working institution at the Security Council level, because of course, at many other levels, it most certainly is a working institution, especially when it comes down to the existential threat of climate change, as Annie mentioned. So we are at about three minutes left uh, in our panel. And so what I'd like to do, if we could, is just a lightning round question for each panelist. Uh, and maybe we could go in reverse order. So Danny, then James, then Annie to, uh, to finish us off. And the question is just this, put on your thinking caps, look into your crystal balls, if you will, uh, with so much attention focused right now on Ukraine, what other foreign policy challenges in the near to midterm are we not paying attention about that we should be paying a lot more attention to? That's a, that's a great one. I mean, you know, at least from the United States perspective, we're such a behemoth of a government organization that there's there's always somebody in the US government that is paying attention to something, whether it's climate change, right? We have you know, former Secretary John Kerry leading up the effort on that to, um, you know, artificial intelligence. So I don't know if it's that we're that we're not paying attention to, but probably not in a strategic enough way. Um, all of those, almost like everything else, right? Like, um, you know, climate change, definitely. Um, artificial intelligence, you know, future technology. Um, I think I think what I would um, like for us to think about is, is, you know, emerging technology and what, as we're talking about the international order here, like what mechanisms do we need to in place to either regulate, to understand, you know, if it's not just, um, you know, the use of Facebook and how Facebook is used in different areas um, and technology and social media platforms like that, even just artificial intelligence, um, drones, right? Are we having enough conversation about the use of drones? Um, I know that it's Harry and James are, but you know, are, are, is the rest of the international world and um, having legislation and organizations around that? Um, gosh, I, so I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm I'm not giving you a, a direct answer enough, but I think all all of these issues are are important. But I guess if I'm going to pick one, I'm going to go with uh, emerging technology, um, and I would even put you know social media platforms and drone technology, even if it's it's um, you know not the newest technology anymore. But figuring out how do we how do we I hate to use the word regulate, but how are we 
how are we putting our arms around the use and dissemination of that type of technology? Um, I'd, I'd love to see us think about that and, and not just these acute problems. And I don't mean to minimize what's going on in Ukraine, but um, anyway. Uh, uh, my, my money is, my, is, is on the emerging technologies. That's what I'd like us to focus more on. Thanks so much, Danny. Cheers. So many things to talk about going through my head, but no time at all. So I will just segue nicely from Danny's point and appreciate the mention of drones. But I would say here, as we reflect 20 years on from 9-11, which is what this event is all about, that, that I urge policymakers not to take their eyes off the threat of terrorism because it does interlink with that drone threat as well. As you see terrorists as an arm of hostile nation states, then you start to see terrorists flexing their muscles with ever more sophisticated, incredibly sophisticated, longer range air power technologies. We're not talking hundreds of kilometers in terms of precision threat with a 10 meter CEP. We're talking about thousands of kilometers and able to strike the inner city, capital cities, of our allies. To what point does that threat, that threat from precision air power that people like Albert Wallstatter and Freda Clay warned us about back in the 80s, to what point does that start to present a threat back to cities in Europe, um, if not the continental United States? So terrorism can form in different ways and the hostile threat of air power, something we have not faced in a generation from a nation state is most certainly something that we need to worry about in terms of nation states, but also in terms of the terrorists they supply. Thank you, James. I'll build on that to talk about something quite different, which is migration uh, and refugees. Um, I, you know, individuals, human, powerless, you know, faceless, nameless to, to the policymaker in great numbers make policy. And there are great numbers of people who are either migrants right now or want to be, and a large number of them really should qualify as refugees under the existing refugee convention. And so we as a world system of nation states with borders that we take very, very seriously, we have not figured out any kind of workable answer to tens of millions of people who wanna change location. Uh, and, and they won't be denied. So we do need a different system of dealing with migration and waves of population movement. Thank you so much to all three of our panelists. Uh, Dr. Krebs, thank you so much for uh, co-moderating the panel with me. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. So in the chat one more time, links to the bipartisan policy review if you'd like to continue discussion, and we very much hope to welcome you to a future IOPGA program uh, in the upcoming weeks. And you can find out more about our schedule on our website one last time, iopga.cornell.edu. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time.